going to climb a tree. Watch out. Ah! Hey everybody, I'm Brian Hank, and uh, I have another episode of the Board Game Business Podcast for you. Uh, this is something we haven't done in a while. It's a panel. It's a panel from LA Comic Con, which happened last weekend. Uh, this one is called The Golden Age of Tabletop Gaming, uh, and it was, uh, it was focused on building gaming communities, um, helping them grow, making them more inclusive. Uh, it was hosted by Will Paskin of High Voltage, who uh, helps run uh, quite a few board gaming groups in the LA area. It had panelists such as myself, but don't worry, I am pretty quiet on this one. I don't talk too much. Um, you could hear from cooler people um, like um, Chris O'Neill of Brotherwise Games, uh, Ross Thompson of IDW Games, um, uh, David Zuckman of Obscure Reference Games. You also get to hear from John Clare from the designer perspective. He designed Mystic Vale, uh, Downfall, and others. So, um, yeah, this one is a little bit longer than usual. It's 50 minutes, uh, but it'll be worth it because you get to hear from these different voices, those you haven't heard from, at least from our podcast, uh, get their perspective on, on tabletop communities and, and what's coming next. So uh, that is what you have in store for you. Please enjoy. All right. Hello, everybody. How are we all doing today? Great. Great. Awesome, awesome. Welcome to the golden age of tabletop gaming. This is a panel focused on, well, how awesome games are. I'm sure you guys already know that because you're in this room. Um, and also how to build and grow a gaming community and how to make it more inclusive as the years go on. Uh, have you guys already done introductions? No. no. All right, so I'll start with myself. My name is Will Pasquin. I'm part of High Voltage. It's a company and we host a lot of gaming events. Uh, Let's start down there and just go through the line and introduce yourself. I'm John Clare. I'm a game designer. I did probably most notably Mysticville. Um, and I've got a few other coming out on Kickstarter right now. Downfalls on Kickstarter. I'm designing lots of games. Uh, I'm David Zuckman of Obscure Reference Games. We just have the one right now, Overlords of Infamy. Uh, got a lot of ideas in the pipeline there. I'm uh, Ross Thompson. I work at uh, IDW Games. I also run uh, Kingdom Con at Kingdom Con in San Diego. Uh, we just finished up our Kickstarter for the Legend of Korra Parody Arena, so that was super cool. Chris O'Neill from Brotherwise Games, uh, best known probably for Boss Monster. We just came out with Unearth at Gen Con, uh, and we've got the uh, free releases coming up in 2018, I guess. Brian Hank, uh, Overworld Games, best known for Good Cop, Bad Cop, uh, New Salem, Leaders of Euphoria. Yeah, right, cool. So that's who we all are. Uh, just an icebreaker question. Let's go down the line. What are your favorite games of the past year, give or take? Year-ish? Yeah, year-ish, and um, why? So it's probably, for, for 2017 releases, it's premature, because all, all the games are releasing like this week at Essen, right? right? Um, the game I've played the most that came out this year is Bunny Kingdom, um, <laughs> if any of you guys have played that. Uh, Richard Garfield's game is a drafting game. That one we've played a lot. Easy to hit the table for. Um, near and Far, really enjoyed that one, um, and I've played a bunch of Great Western Trail. Yeah. I've heard good things, yeah. yeah. Um, I played a lot of Starfinder recently, nice. um, yeah, I love the tabletop <laughs> uh, RPGs, and uh, probably the best game, one of the better games I've played this year that hits the table a lot is one of his custom heroes. Yeah. Uh, I'm really enjoying playing role player. Um, it's, a, it's a dice game where you essentially build your D&D characters, so it's uh, been a lot of fun. And then, I guess I'm really looking forward to Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. Mm. So, um, we're, big, we're a big group playing a lot of 3rd Edition stuff, so it'll be fun to see what the changes you got, are. You've got a spare three days. Uh, we actually have got it down where we can do about four to, six, four, to six, <laughs> four to six players in like five hours. That's awesome. So, and that includes setup. We essentially, I can talk about it for a little bit, but we kind of changed up how the rules are going. So we play with all the... Uh, scenario that is already out that we don't have to flip it over, and then we've got a few floating victory points where you can vote with assembly and then some other stuff. So, yeah. Twilight's first first board game I ever bought. Oh, awesome! Love it. Still, still in my dove right in. Still right in. That's ballsy. Uh, it's, it's just a while. Um, I was able to play a couple games at Gen Con. Uh, Ascension, which is uh, really fun, um, and Century Spice Road. Uh, they, they both kind of love play. Um, sort of right up my alley. Um, Super fun. Super fun. I think I'll, uh, I'll go with Yokohama 
uh, from TMG. Uh, just a lot of crunchy decisions, but in like a nice little package, like simple rules. Like it's pretty straightforward too. So, uh, and then one that's coming out, I'm gonna go with Edge of Darkness by Mr. Uh, Claire over there. <laughs> so that one is coming out. AEG, I think. AEG is doing yeah. it. Yeah, that'll be on Kickstarter in February. Yeah. yeah can, you, can you tell? Them? I don't know. I don't want to spoil anything. Can you say anything about it? I can. I mean, it's so. Uh, if you're familiar with Mystic Veil, vale, it has that card crafting system at its core. Edge of Darkness was actually the first card crafting game I designed. Um, for those not familiar with card crafting, it uses um, uh, card sleeves and then transparent cards that sort of you put multiple in the single sleeve that cr creates a card and they overlap. Um, and Edge of Darkness is sort of a meatier, more complex um, game than Mystic Veil. Vale. Cool. And I'll say for me, uh, I just got. Um, I was a big fan of the original Arcadia Quest, uh, like only or not, and Inferno I got uh, this year, so I love that. And also, uh, Overlord's of Infamy by David over there. Really awesome, hilarious game. If you don't know it, definitely worth it. Yeah. All right, cool. So let's dive right in. I think it's the main question and the theme of this panel. How does one create from scratch a gaming, specifically a tabletop gaming community? What are the key ingredients of having a tabletop community? What do you think? I'll hold on that one. So uh, I got my start essentially in the industry by being a press ganger for Kaiser Free Press. And that was all about uh, running tournaments at game stores and doing a league. And so essentially, the, the main thing that kept our league going when we grew from six players to about 40 over the course of a couple months, and then would go to tournaments up in LA and Riverside and Vegas and Arizona was essentially being consistent. So as long as you can show up and have someone to play with, that means that your community will grow. And you can talk about gaming all you want and you know, be online and Facebook and forums and talk about all these things, but unless you know, someone can, there's someone there to show up and play a game. And so being that press ganger or that like alpha gamer in that system, like I was always there on Monday at six until nine. And if you wanted to play a game, we were gonna do it. And that's essentially what I feel that it makes that community grow. As long as you can show up and play a game, then you're there. Like everything else is, you know, extra. If you want to do the giveaways and the promotions and all the cooler stuff and tournaments and leagues and all those things, but as long as you can show up and play, I think we see that now with, with meetup groups and stuff like that and conventions and other stuff. Is as long as someone can show up and get a game to play, that's the core of what what we're doing. I can I can add to that too. So uh, I think just being welcoming is like like for new people who come in uh, because you can you can have like I've been involved in a lot of different groups but like the ones that that stay like the same size or you know kind of disappear it's usually because they aren't welcoming to the people who come in who are new you know if, if there's someone there that says you know come sit down play a game you know join us that in and the people who come for the first time they'll keep coming and I think that that's a key ingredient definitely yeah inclusiveness I think is a general theme you want to we want to be welcoming and want people to know that it's okay. It's not some private thing that they, uh, like some of the events that High Voltage hosts, uh, one of them is at Dave & Buster's, and we've we've heard the front staff at Dave & Buster's turn people away. People look at our event and go, oh, that looks cool, and they say, no, it's a private event. And we're like, no, <laughs> bad, very bad. So, yes, definitely inclusiveness. Anyone else have anything to add, key uh, ingredients? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just springboarding off of the welcoming. Uh, my first major foray into board gaming whatsoever uh, was actually HeroClix way back when. Uh, so playing HeroClix, there's a, there was a, a, a friendly local game store nearby called Brave New World in New Hall. They're fantastic, by the way. Um, they just had this community already built up, and anyone that wanted to come play, here's some stuff for you to play with. You can even take it home with you. Go ahead. I'm like, whoa. Okay. And uh, that really drew me in, and it eventually led to my bigger addiction. And it's really nice if we can expand, if we can use communities to expand the amount of people playing games, right? And um, uh, part of that is the people already in the group being willing to go back, right? You know, we always want to play the new hot stuff, right? And a lot of gamers, at least in groups that I know, want to go straight to the big games, right? Um, but the people in the group, you know, when someone new shows up and they're like, I've played Settlers of Catan, right? Um, you don't want to say, well, now come join our game of Yokohama, right? You know, uh, and, and if a group is excited that new people want to become gamers, um, that group is going to find more people wanting to, you know, coming back a second time. Awesome. That's a good transition. It's sort of a, a, a culture of being friendly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so the next question, how do we get, you sort of started to answer, how do we get people who don't consider themselves hardcore gamers or people who don't even consider themselves gamers at all, who wouldn't put that label on them, how do we turn them into gamers or how do we make them feel like you don't have to be a hardcore gamer in order to enjoy a tabletop community or a game night? I'll speak from the publisher perspective for yeah. that. Um, I, I think ultimately a lot of it comes down to the products that are being offered. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of barriers to entry to gaming. One is sort of the novelty of the gaming environment, learning the, the sort of the rules of the game, how complex it is. The other is the sort of whether it's an insular environment like we sort of imagine um, gaming maybe used to be. I think it's grown and become really mainstream and mm -hmm. sort of more culturally accepted. Um, but one of the things we really try to do is when we sit down to design a game or when we, we consider a game that's um, been submitted to us, one of the things we think about is, is this going to bring in the non-gamers? Um, and there's a lot of things you can do for that. You can increase the luck percentage in the game. You can go for themes that are more appealing to a broader audience. Um, but I, I think a lot of it starts with the product. If all we're offering is sort of huge, lengthy, miniature heavy, high fiscal investment games, we shouldn't be surprised if we're not getting as many folks into that gaming environment as we want to. Not to say there's not a place for those games, because most of my collection is those games. Um, but I think we have to think as publishers about what we're offering. Are we offering products that feature people of color, uh, feature women? You know, are, there, are there ways that we can sort of reach out beyond that gaming environment? Um, and I think it's important for publishers now more than ever, because we're entering a new period where there's so many new games coming out every week that we've entered sort of a cult of the minute. You know, what is what is the uh, what is what is this minute's hot game? Um, and if you want your game to be played, you got to find more gamers to play it. There's just not enough gamers out there for all the games that are coming out right now, and there's certainly not enough shelf space in stores for those. Yeah, to, to put off of that, that's uh, something we were actually talking about last week in the office. Um, so IDW deals with, with a lot of different licenses, and it's been um, you know. What license are we going to pick for a game that's going to help either bring in existing gamers or more into that fandom? And uh, I, I think we found with Cora that we did a Kickstarter for that, but even though the game was semi heavy, that I think that Cora fan base were people that had never seen Kickstarter, didn't know what Board Game Geek was, didn't know any of that stuff. And so, kind of making a game that fit for them while still being a game that's engaging for gamers is, uh, is kind of neat. And then to play off of that, like the, the gamer label can sometimes be a bit of a gatekeeper label. And I think it's important to realize that, you know, anybody that plays games or even has an interest in what games are can consider themselves a, can consider themselves a gamer. You know, like you don't have to know, oh my gosh, like the new Starfinder mod came out last week and you gotta get it and then they have the new Kickstarter coming out this week. It's like, who cares? You know, like there's always a new game coming out, there's always something new coming out. But just because you don't know what's up on that or you haven't played, you know, this random expansion for this game doesn't make you not a gamer. So I think being aware of that kind of makes that group, as I've already said, that welcomingness, that openingness, right? Like if we can kind of embrace that and celebrate that a little bit more, that there's a lot of games out there for everyone to play that will be in a good boat. I feel there's also kind of a stigma of just calling yourself a gamer. Like you, you're talking about the la label being a gatekeeper. Sure, it's, it's a gatekeeper. It might separate two people that might like that, but somebody that has no idea that they'll be into gaming at all, um, they look at that label of, of gamer O, oh, so don't have a job or in the basement or something like that. It's it's this it's a terrible label that really does not exist anymore, uh, in, or, or it still exists but it shouldn't. Yeah, I mean I not to jump in again, but like I, I, guys, we've seen right now like some of the best growing content on Twitch has been you know is role playing games and D and D games and if you know and it's looking at seeing how accessible that stuff is. You know I've got people that have watched Critical Role that. You know, never would have thought about playing a role playing game before, and they watched a couple episodes and go, "Oh man, I want to do that." And they're like, "That's awesome!" You know, let's play some games and be a gamer. And that's a way better way of looking at it than going, "Oh my gosh, here's these ten million board games you got to try first before I can even consider playing with you." You know, so yeah. Cool. Uh, it was sort of brought up, uh, but the idea of theme and trends and how the industry is constantly changing. How do you, as a, a designer or a publisher or what have you, stay on top of the trends? And what do you guys think are going to be the trends for 2018? I'll, I'll take it first. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So I, um, 
as a designer, um, I find it important to stay on top of the new games that are coming out. Um, uh, I fortunately have, um, you know, uh, in LA, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about this probably later, right? But in LA, there's a lot of potential gaming communities, right? And um, from West Side Gamers out on my end, uh, Strategicon, um, there's a lot of playtest groups. And I try to go to those groups and play as many different games as possible. Um, there's a lot of games I only ever play once. Um, uh, but as a designer, I'm always trying to see what the new stuff is, especially if anything's getting you know particularly good reviews. I want to know why, right? Um, and that you know that informs my game design. Um, uh, the trends that I see for uh, the trend lately, certainly in the hob in the in the more hobby end of the spectrum, um, I would say is a is a move towards campaign driven games. Um, uh, uh, and there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of legacy games that um, are either legacy or pseudo legacy being added to games. Um, so I think I think the the move to there used to be you know uh, story driven games right, and then you have deep strategy games. And there's a there's a good move lately towards having both of those things in heavier you know, hobby hobby end games. I think uh, I think presentation too is something that yeah. like the the bar keeps getting raised for presentation. Um, you, the games that are coming out now are just uh, fantastic from artwork, you know, to having minis or other super cool components or really unique components. And so it, it just uh, companies, you know, publishers are trying to find ways to stand out from you know there's so many games coming out, and one of the ways to do it is just having better and better and better presentations. So. Yeah, there's any one overarching trend, it's that games just keep getting better, right? Yeah. The quantity of games coming out and the quality of games coming out is um, just on an upward trajectory. Uh, and for anybody in the industry, that means it's just that much harder for us, right? Yeah. It's not, you can't make a good game anymore. You have to make a really good game. Well, right? there, well, there, so like 3,000 games came out last year, right? And I think the trend this year is going to be like 8,000 games to the next year. And uh, what's, I mean, there were 40 games on Kickstarter this week alone, you know, and whether they last the 30 days or the two weeks or however long they do the campaign, you know, and then Essence coming out right now, so we're seeing, right now, so we're seeing all the games that are going to be hitting, you know, quarter one and quarter two. Um, but I think what's, one of the trends that really stands out for me, and I think Unearth can speak to that, is that uh, really pretty games and really well designed art in smart games, so it's not just like the classic magic card of you've got three hands, you're doing that. How can you take that icon and make it into something simple? For example, be a really cool game. And so, like, uh, that was something we do at Origins. That was the big takeaway I think from Earth and how it just looked good and stood out from other people's stuff. And so, that was neat. Yeah, I'll make, um, I'll be the guy who, uh, I'll be the Cassandra. Um, so, uh, gaming is growing too fast. There's, uh, you know, going from 3,000 games in a year to 8,000 games. Um, that's actually, that's great in a lot of ways, and I'm all for it, and it's, it's really terrific. Uh, but a couple things happen. Um, one is that retail shelf space has become a premium. So there's so many games coming out that not only can retailers not shelve them, they certainly can't learn them. And if you can't learn a game as a retailer, it's very hard to teach that game. It's hard to get people excited about the games. So what we're finding is that even though tons of games are coming out, we're seeing a smaller fraction of them that are making a bigger splash and getting retailers' attention. And retailers now are focusing more on what's going on. The other thing that's happening is that the, the big boys, Target and Barnes and & Noble and the other big box stores are now realizing that there's a lot of money to be made in games. And so I don't know if you've been to your friendly neighborhood Target recently, but the strategy game shelf has been growing and growing and growing and the family game shelf has been shrinking and shrinking. 75 games exclusive. So yeah, and, and they're doing these exclusive games. So as they do that, um, also probably a good thing because we're reaching out to a broader audience. Um, probably, I actually disagree with John a little bit. I think there's gonna be a longer term trend away from higher strategy games towards more accessible, simpler games as publishers realize they can make more money selling those games to the bigger box stores. But it means that you as the gaming audience, you've gotta sort of vote with your feet and you've gotta decide where am I gonna spend my gaming dollars? Um, and if we're talking about community, Target's a great place for getting games into people's hands. It's not a great, 
place for them meeting new gamers, for them sharing their love of games. Um, that really, for me, happens in the gaming store and, other, and a lot of other venues. So um, I think a couple things are likely to happen. One is I think we're likely to see a contraction in the number of games that are being put out. Not, maybe not this coming year, but maybe pretty soon. And I don't think that's a bad thing. The other thing is I think we're likely to see a contraction in the number of stores, of, of retail gaming stores, in the short term as these bigger box stores sort of pick up a bigger share of the market. I think that will probably trend correct itself after a while, though, I hope. So the, the real question is, though, right, as, as the industry keeps growing and the number of games coming out, is the number of evergreen titles that come out every year going to continue to go up, oh, right? Yeah. The number of evergreen titles is is not 8,000 a year, right? right. Um, nowhere near that, right? It's maybe 12, right? I think, um, you know? I, may, I mean, you could Munchkin, Telestrations, Catan. Right, uh, games that in 10 right. years yeah, will, be, will be, will be yeah. still mm -hmm. selling, you know, a lot. Um, I know, so, um, that, that was just, that's just, I guess, an observation, but um, that's a, that's a part of the industry that, you know, it, the 8,000 games that come out every year, most people never hear of 7,900 of them, right? Right. Um, uh, and, and, of course, the, pe the deeper you are in the hobby end of the board game spectrum, the more of that you hear about, right? And the more that interests you, right? But, yeah, speaking from a mass market perspective, uh, I, I'm, I, would, I would wonder how much it even has increased over the last few years, the number of sort of evergreen titles that will stick around for another decade, right? Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and kind of another trend that just is, is popping up recently is uh, Asmodee Digital and the amount of titles they're bringing in. So like yesterday it was announced that Munchkin was going to be on Asmodee Digital. And uh, so that's really exciting and interesting in its own way. And along with that, they launched their Twitch channel and then did a rebrand of their logo. So Asmodee has been you know, um, growing and growing as a company. You've seen this fancified games and Days of Wonder Z-Man Games kind of all go under their umbrella, and then a lot of other publishers that are making games here in the U.S. are going through Asmodee in Europe and the U.K. and stuff like that. Right, it's essentially a new thing. And uh, so it's interesting to see how that's growing as well, because even with the app, there's an app that came out called Dice, where you can essentially learn how to play. Um, they'll make the rule book for you and walk you through all these cool instructions, and it's going a lot of companies are working with them to get their um, their rule books made to do that, which is super cool because now you, if you're a visual learner, you know you can learn the, the games that way. And so, you know, going away from more of the you know the analog paper rule books to the you know in my device in my hand, how do you consume what a board game is? It have to be on the table. There's a company called Experiment Seven right now that's working on doing AR, VR tabletop work, and they just licensed with Wizards of the Coast to do D and D, and they just announced they're going to do VR Catan. So now you can play Catan on VR, and they've got it at Essen right now, and uh, you know, so you're able to walk them through the game through the So it's uh, kind of a neat thing. Actually, at Boss Monster in VR. There you go. Mm -hmm. well, so what are, uh, this should probably be a pretty quick question, but what are the benefits of tabletop gaming as opposed to other types of gaming, like video games? I mean, like why, why are we seeing such a, a growth in people wanting to sit down and play a game on the table as opposed to online with their buddies. Social. Yeah. Sensory overload, yeah, actually, <laughs> is what I'm gonna say. Uh, as, as we moved away from board games towards video games in the 80s, 90s, the aughts, um, and the uh, MMO market came out, and the mass, it just, playing with so many people at once, it's sensory overload. And then you, you want to interact with all these people, and then you feel inadequate or incomplete if you can't interact with everybody that you see there. So, at least in my case, you shrink back down to the table where you can have these interpersonal relationships with you know, three or four other people and play games together and feel like you're getting the full experience. Yeah, I think you, you see people going to work and they sit at their computer all the time and then they go on a lunch break and they are looking at their phone and you know walking on the sidewalk and everyone's just so, so consumed by the internet and you know the digital world and and people don't realize it I don't think but they just crave that social interaction and so board games is just a perfect way to do it and people I think are getting worse at socially you know interacting with one another other humans like face to face so like board games give you a set of rules that 
take you through, step you through that that interaction. Uh, like they're almost helping people, you know, who maybe maybe aren't as as good at doing that. You know, just um, so you know, have fun. You're playing a game, but you don't even realize that you're also interacting with the people around the table. But but everybody does have that just kind of craziness, and, and so that's what we're we're giving people. And that's a really good point. Uh, who remembers the first week of Pokemon Go? <laughs> right, I. Cool. Yeah, it really was. You know, everybody was getting along. It there was, was world peace. So <laughs> good, it was so good. And that social interaction is really cool. And I think that's really easy to get captured at a at a game store, at a game convention, at game event. You know, and that's something that board games do. Even if you're playing the same game you've played for the last thirty years, or you're checking out the new game that came out last week, you know, it's that. Hey, you get to see how their face is a poker face, or they didn't do a thing from the country. Some of that interaction, and I think people are paying attention to that a little bit. But that's kind of what's fun about. The problem is, no one stuck around for the second week of Pokemon Go. You're not wrong. Well, well, the servers I still play. play. <laughs> <laughs> and awesome. Yeah. Right. Uh, so one other thing I think has added to the growth of the tabletop community and the amount of people actually getting together and playing games. Because I remember in my childhood, a lot of people wanted to do it, but it was hard to organize. Um, the the amount of social media and the amount of that that has grown and become universally accepted and the amount of actual applications there's facebook there's meetup there's tons of different avenues on social media that you can reach out and find and communicate with people you did not know before and just say like here's five of us we're talking on social media we didn't know each other but sure let's get together and play some games uh, so well, also i mean geeks are winning the culture war right you know, being <laughs> <laughs> give yourselves a hand. Sure. Yeah. You know, no longer must we be afraid. Yeah, uh, being being a geek is is cool now, right? And and board games were always seen as something geeky, which is now cool, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's not weird to go play board games after work with your co coworkers anymore, right? That's, or even after. That's like or, even or at where I was playing. I was playing a board game at work yesterday, right? Like <laughs> we all were, right? Like, <laughs> We got some in the lunchroom at our work now. Yeah. yeah. Dirty lunch. And 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 you know, I would I, I think there's a case to be made. I don't know if it's true, but you know, everyone was you know, there was always enough people who liked board games. They just didn't know they liked it, right? And as and as board games get more and more out there, more and more people play Catan for the first time and then say, What else is out there, right? Um, and you know, back in the seventies and eighties there wasn't that proliferation of games, so people never got that first experience. Yeah. Uh, also, I forgot to make the announcement. I don't know if you guys have talked about it before. I we got some giveaways for you guys. Just fun stuff, so uh, afterwards, uh, we're going to open it up to some questions from the audience, and if you ask a question, mm -hmm. just get some. <laughs> so go, go, go. Uh, so on, on, the, on the classic games kind of thing, so I had a year where I worked at USA Outway, and uh, they do the Monopoly a lot of the classic games and stuff like that. And you know, well, funny enough, right? <laughs> so it, it's interesting because when I was working there, there was this there's this stigma when you know when you hear Monopoly, everyone goes, "Er, Monopoly, you know, what is that?" Um, and they crank out a lot of really cool licensed Monopolies, so like Dragon Ball Z Monopoly and Rick and Morty and all those things like that, which are super fun. And you think like, "Oh man, who's buying that? What what are they doing?" And you realize, you know, that's a company of sixty people. That is literally making you know these companies for mass and for hobby and for online, and those games, the clues and the monopolies and the Nazis, you know, they still keep game stores going. And so, you know, when you see Guardians of the Galaxy Yahtzee, you're like, oh man, it looks like a label slap. But then you pick it up and you're like, oh, this cool little game. You got to capture Groot and do all this stuff. And so even though it's not like you know Mystic Veil or some crazy new game that just came out, like it's fun because there's a whole community that likes that interaction but just isn't aware of the board game revolution that's happening right now. So I think on the inclusiveness that we've been kind of touching about the whole panel, you know, when someone brings a board game and they go, oh, Monopoly, oh, I have Clue, I go, awesome, let's play that and then try this. So. Yeah, I feel like that's a, those are good transitions. It's comfortable for people who don't consider themselves gamers. They see Rick and Morty Monopoly. It's like, oh, I know Monopoly. It's comfortable territory, but then the Rick and Morty, it's a new aspect. Sort of almost like the idea of a, a gateway game or a Yeah, transition. well, but Monopoly Gamer came out uh, for the GameStop with Hasbro, and uh, that game kind of broke the board game industry for the weekend. 
Um, and everyone had to rush out and get it and then get the six boosters. I only got four, I was really upset. And, uh, and that game plays in 20 minutes. It's essentially Mario Party, but Monopoly. They just took out the having to get all these beats. Whoever kills the four bosses, the game's over. And then if you can't afford everything, then your coins go down on the thing, and the next person picks it up and you keep going. It's simple, you can do it in five seconds. It's super so, fun. Yeah. yeah, right? It's, it's ridiculously fun. Yeah. That game got such a bad rap, too. It's because it's Monopoly. Monopoly likes to have Monopoly. It doesn't sound like Monopoly, but it's fun. Yeah. Um, All right, so I'm going to try and combine it a few questions here to save some time. Uh, we talked about social media for a brief second, but in terms of creating and growing a community once it's already been created, and in terms of creating uh, games, how has social media helped or hurt the overall gaming community? And also I'm going to broaden that up to just tech, growing technology in general. How is that, uh, can that be useful for tabletop communities? Does that hurt tabletop communities? Probably both. What do you guys think? I, I mean, I never lived in a world that didn't have the opportunity to make Facebook groups, right? Um, but I can imagine it'd be a lot harder without it to organize playtests um, and uh, you know message friends. Hey, you free to playtest this night? You know, um, that's a, it's essential to pretty much all the playtesting I do. Yeah, from a design standpoint, Facebook, Meetup.com, that yeah. kind of thing. It's it's the way to get people to come over and say, hey, I've got pizza and beer. Do you want to play a new game I'm making? Yeah, I think uh, meetup meetup.com is just yeah. amazing for finding groups in your area, especially if you're moving, because I know I've moved quite a bit over the last few years, and when I move to a new city, then I can just go to meetup.com, and I can find a whole bunch of groups in my area and go meet new people who like the things that I like and want to play games. So that, that, that I think, is, is, is the most important. Part of, I guess you could almost say social media uh, for the community from my perspective. We've, uh, so if you guys, uh, I don't know, how many of you are on Twitter? Yeah, I'm about to. Um, <laughs> so I've searched Twitter because I don't have a Twitter account, but if you go search on Twitter and I search for our new game on Earth, like hashtag on Earth, first you get the metal band on Earth, it's mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Second, you get on Earth the game. Um, and every day, every week, somebody's because the game is very visually oriented, it looks very pretty in photos, somebody's always posting to Twitter or, we'll see how, what's the other one? Instagram. 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 I'm so old. Uh, so, somebody's putting up an Instagram photo of, uh, of Unearth, and it's, you know, you can't buy that kind of advertising. You can't buy that kind of marketing. Um, it's not just getting people together, it's helping share products. It's helping share excitement about products. Um, and in gaming, where again, as somebody, all of us have probably said, breaking through the, um, you know, the flotilla of games coming down the stream every week, it's really hard now. Um, and it's it's important to have people out there talking about your game. So social media has become just an irreplaceable way to sort of share information about games. And I'm sure all of you have done it in some form or another, either on Facebook or uh, some other. One of those things, right? One of those things. And so I, I, I live on social media. It's, it's like half my job. And um, for, for board games, it's neat. So the picture one Instagram, um, that's really fun with that, is the, if you type in hashtag board games or hashtag board game art and things like that, you're going to see some really cool photos, you know, and it's like people taking photos of their food exhibiting for board games, you know, and it's, you'd be amazed how many cool meeples or can be posed in extra cool ways or, you know, we've got Saikatsu and people are taking photos of it, you know, next to koi ponds and things like that. And so it's sharing in that hobby that you want, you kind of want to celebrate that, right? And so whether it's from a publisher side, you're like, great, that's free marketing, super cool, we can do a contest where, hey, if you do hashtag this and share it out, we can win some games and that's super awesome. Um, or with Facebook, you know, face, on our side, the algorithms are down, so you have to sponsor more ads and do more things, and that kind of sucks. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of really good Facebook groups that are out there. So Board Game Geek has their, has their website, it has a couple of their groups, and there's like five or six other groups that have like, you know, 40,000 people in them, and so a lot of the industry spams those groups with a lot of announcements and things. But at the same time, you get a lot of those people that are like, oh my gosh, here's my Sheltie. You know, and that's been a big thing in the gaming industry recently. Is People taking their five by six IKEA shelves and just covering them in board games. Being like, look at that! How you know? It's yeah. freaking awesome! And like Games Workshop, you turn to marketing 
uh, this year. That's been a big thing for 2017. And uh, they rocked the world. They were like, hey, look, we can do social media too. And their Facebook has been blowing up with all these photos and videos and stuff like that. And we all want to consume more content. I think that's kind of the thing right now is we're looking at our phone all the time. What can we see and stuff like that. So it's neat to see that. Um, who here is trying to make a board game? Cool, okay, cool. So there's a lot of groups for that, right? So you can literally type in tabletop publishers into Facebook, get five or six groups, and just ask questions. And there's a bunch of groups I'm in right now that like, people are asking, oh, what do you think about these different kinds of games? And they can ask all this stuff, and the, the guy that made the site, he pops in there and talks about stuff. Or insurance from Cool and Not goes, well, if you're gonna get your game published in China, you should do those six things, you know? So it's neat that that connection is there on social media. So obviously, if you wanna build your community and grow that, that's there as well, but at the same time, you know, you'd be amazed who's lurking in the threads. So there's also Indie Game Alliance, yeah. which I can't recommend enough. It's, it's, it, they're not a big <coughs> company. Uh, you, your own company or whatever, you can go in there and it's just tons of people sharing what's worked for them and what's not. They'll give you feedback. It's fantastic. So the social media seems to be pretty uh, unanimous, has very much helped the tabletop community in terms of finding players. Especially my space. Getting. <laughs> <laughs> that one I know. Yeah. <laughs> I think my, my, what is it, top five friends or something? Tom, Tom is in my top five. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so social media is obviously quite the boon. Uh, what about other types of technology as um, the video game industry? I always consider myself a gamer of all calibers. I've mostly played video games my whole life. I think largely now I've switched over to start playing board games a lot more because I have more people around me who play board games. It's easier. As opposed to video games, it's easier to just play by yourself. Um, but as the technology increases and video games become more and more impressive, and even some video games start to steal tabletop games, like you were talking about VR games, you can now yeah. show yourself so in your own bubble. And there's, play there's two things right now that are pretty big for uh, tabletop gaming and technology. Uh, that is the ability to stream. It's really easy now to you know stream from your phone with Facebook Live or hook it up through that. And so Twitch has really embraced uh, tabletop gaming. They have Wizard of the Coast has their own D and D section where they're constantly playing new modules and doing things like that. Uh, you're seeing a lot of groups use Facebook Live to share their new events. Kickstarter even just implemented their own live stream through Kickstarter. So you're seeing a lot of these guys that have launched their game and immediately within the first hour they're already doing a live play and Q and A right there, and they're like, awesome. You know, how cool is that? Um, and then we can go into all the VR stuff too, but I think we're at a time right now where uh, the technology is almost going too fast for how we want to do, and people are trying to figure out what's the best way that I can consume be a part of that community. Um, it's easy to be on Facebook, but it, I mean, people just got used to using Twitter, so now they have to get used to watching Twitch, and even though Twitch is like one of the largest growing I can watch it and, you know, League of Legends World is happening right now and they have like 40 million people watching, you know, body games and other stuff. But that doesn't mean that they're going to watch board games too. But you hope so? I was at TwitchCon last week um, and I got to talk to some of the people that were running the, the board game section there. Uh, Twitch really wants to go all mm -hmm. in on board games. So I think that's pretty fantastic. Yeah. But other technologies that are um, Really helpful out there. There's one that I really couldn't get behind. I, I couldn't see why anybody would want to do this, but Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator. They're, they're computer programs, or not programs, apps, websites that you can go to and you can find board games that you enjoy or you can't find other people to play with and actually play those board games digitally with other people around the world. And uh, originally I couldn't get behind that. And then I tried it. I'm like, I can get behind this. This is pretty cool. So um, I thought, thought that was a really cool technology. Also a great... Uh, Prototyping technology. Yes, absolutely. So you can use that without having to print out your whole game that you're working on. You can put it up on Tabletop Simulator and play it you know, within the simulator. Yeah, we do that. So we'll invite you know some hardcore fans to come and play play the next version of you know Good Cop, Bad Cop, or some awesome stuff. Yeah. And then they become evangelists for you. They tell everybody about it when it comes out. It's fantastic. I think there's lots of neat stuff happening for accessibility for board games. So whether that's um, color correcting glasses for color blindness, whether it's these sort of VR technologies or tabletop simulators for folks who are house to house. Um, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff happening accessibility wise. I want to say Boss Monster a long time ago partnered with this um, Braille sleeve. Uh, it's company. like a four ounce game. Yeah, so they, they do these sleeves, which are cellulose, cellulose mm -hmm. sleeves or whatever. 
but you put your card in there and it's got the Braille for folks right on there. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, that means, you know, it's, it's it would be, you know, there's no way we could afford to do a Braille friendly version of all this. But if we can partner with these guys to do the sleeves. That's awesome. That's super, that is really cool. It is super cool. And it's such a simple idea. All right. Well, now we want to open it up to the audience for questions. So raise your hand uh, or stand up. Uh, Hi, I'm Terry. <coughs> Something you've done, you just not a, a thought, but you just said it. Uh, picture the sleeves having holographic hol holograms in them, so you can see the whole thing with the glasses on. Interesting idea. For that is an interesting, interesting idea. idea. <laughs> Something else for game. I was just thinking about that. Um, wow. the, I totally lost the thought now. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Um, is there any chance you guess that there might? These are board game. I mean, art, I mean, comic conventions. But we used to have Gen Con West years ago, a decade ago. Any chance? We might have gaming conventions back in town. We have the so, strategic con. Yeah, that's not a thing, though. So I mean, right. gaming con in San Diego. What? Um, it's about, it's called Kingdom Con. It's like 1,200 people. Um, I keep small on purpose. It's like a big board game night. I don't tell for four days straight. It's pretty cool. Um, uh, Gen Con could come out here, but they have to want to do it. Huh? You know, California is really expensive. Yeah, because I want to see, I want to see them bring, you know, Show new games here, like not just not just going to like. So let them know. Yeah, because that's what I'd like. They, they, they Gen Con sure. was yeah. awesome. It was here before. I agree. Awesome. That would be awesome. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, so Pax Unplugged is happening in a month, and that's when we have Philadelphia. Okay. I get to um, see. No, 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 no. I get you. I get you right. And then and then Pax East out in Boston has seven thousand people, and when, when that fall comes, we've got about forty thousand people at board games tonight. So it'd be cool to have a California one. I agree. There's also Kubla Con. Yep, it's about three thousand people. Yeah, it's pretty good. Because having a big convention map would they could cut that in half, just like Comic Con San Diego. I get you. Hey, you know, see, and put it all if we place. had any say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're right there. Also, to the gentleman that's going to be there, if you ask a question, then come up, grab a game. I don't know. No good, good system to hand them out, so they might take, a take your pick. So oftentimes, if you get a four group game together, right, or any group, just role playing game, whatever, with different personalities, how do you guys suggest you handle the moments when you have conflicting players? Players throw like oil and water, or worse, throw like a match and a and a gasoline, and they just start lighting each other up, and it just it turns into a total truck. That sounds kind of fun. It, 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 I mean, it's it fun to watch as long as they're your family and you know what buttons to push. But then random stuff happens. How do you all handle that in your gaming groups? Like, because what you don't want is to have the gaming groups that's all because of that. But how do you guys suggest? Well, let me start with one easy question: okay. Is there a common instigator in these events? Because <laughs> in my experience, most people are cool. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's often a common I, it must be me and, and is it you? <laughs> so, um, You're that guy. I am that guy. So, uh, what's helpful for me, uh, in, in a lot of role playing games, they have what's called a session zero. So if you have a bunch of people that haven't played together yet, you get them together for session zero where you can make their characters, you can figure out their likes and dislikes, and most importantly, you find out what the taboo topics are that you're not going to bring up during your adventure. I feel like, and I've done this in the past, something similar for a board game group that you think are going to meet semi-regularly. Get them together, find out their likes and dislikes, what genres do they like, what, what mechanisms and games do they like. I think that, that could work. Without having alcohol. No, 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 don't, don't stop that. <laughs> Let me just say one more thing there. I, I feel good. Um, I think one of the awesome things about gaming is we sort of have this saying, which is kind of cliche at this point, but that there's a, there's a chair for everyone at the table. Um, and it's a very open community, it's a welcoming community. One of the things I love about gaming is that it is something of a place of refuge for folks who may be less socially um, adept, maybe on the spectrum. Um, and I, you know, yeah. whenever I'm gaming with folks, one of the things I'll say is, um, you know, as much as you can help shepherd everyone through this process, as much as you can help the folks who are awkward and having a hard time with it, that's awesome, and the more tolerant you can be, the better. Now, that's not to say there's no place for harassment, there's no place for sexual harassment, there's no place for scaring people, but um, I just run into a lot of gamers who have a hard time having fun in other environments, um, and, the, and the more we can do to try to coach them, help them, shepherd them along, the better. Sometimes that means splitting your gaming group up, doing that's like, we're just gonna play some two-player games today. Uh, blue shirt, we're in the back. Bob Ross. Right. <laughs> Happy trees. I gave, I gave a super good, by the way. Happy games. Yeah. Um, just talking about building a community. Can you talk about uh, the, the uh, what do you think about board game cafes? I understand there's going to be one that's going to be opening up in Los Angeles soon. And 
uh, not far from here actually. Yeah. So uh. yeah, we have, well, LA just got the Guild Hall too, uh, which is pretty cool. It's like a good sports bar. And then down in San Diego, we have one called Addie's at Barrel Harbor, and it's a brewery and a game store. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I really like I, that one. I think uh, I think the most hybrid stores and board games and something else. I think those are going to be the best way to have a game store in the future because if a lot of the game stores are, are created by someone who just loves games and but it's really hard without, I mean, Magic the Gathering is, is what keeps these stores alive, but um, if you take away that, if that loses popularity, there, there's gonna be a lot of challenges. It's really hard to make money with a game store, but if you do a hybrid game store where you're also you know, selling beer, you know, you're, it's a restaurant and a game store, or something like that, you know, that's the way to do it, where you have a couple ways to, to keep money coming in and, and give people something to do. So uh, I think that that's, those hybrid stores are the future. Cool. Uh, uh, Punisher. Um, yeah, where are the <laughs> uh, when you talked about the uh, appeal of board games uh, or tabletop games over electronic games, uh, what I didn't hear, and I'm wondering if I overestimate or you uh, underestimate, is the tactile aspect of it. Uh, you put a chessboard out with really good pieces, and people can't walk by the piece, you know. And, and I think having something that you hold in your hand, throwing dice, playing cards. Uh, is, is really important. You talked about presentation with little nibbles and so on. I, I, yeah, it's, it's both that's tangible. That's a unique sales proposition for me. Tangibility and pace. Um, I'm not a big video gamer just because it's too slow. Like, I can't keep up with the, with the number of clicks per second needed in it. You know, so, you're absolutely right. Uh, three more very quick questions, just quick answers. Uh, red hair. Um, my name is Napoleon. I'm a student game developer at USC. I guess you're just wondering what your thoughts are. Could you say that there's a steep preconception into the market? Um, you know, what would you say to someone who, you know, kind of entering into that market and is not yet in that? that I, I, I kind of want to say something because when I was, when, actually when you were talking earlier, I was thinking, I, I think that the amount of games we're going to keep increasing, I actually think it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger because it's easier and easier to make games. And there's things like Kickstarter and other platforms that help us raise money for it. There's other uh, things like you know VR and, and, and having uh, board games kind of transition into video games or have video game parts for or two of them or augmented reality or you know something like that. There are more and more ways to play games, and so I think it's going to keep growing. So I would say that it, the barrier keeps it, or the uh, you know the, the how much work you have to put into it, the presentation you need to have, the how solid the game is that that keeps getting harder and harder to achieve. You have to do more and more work, but you can still do it, you can still be successful, I'd say, you know, keep, keep at it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I, I would just say it. one thing, in video game development, um, the growth in video games has been, has trended down, been a little flatter over the past few years as board games have been growing. Um, but it's important to remember, board gaming's, you know, one billion dollar industry right about now. Video gaming's still a hundred billion dollar industry. So even though that growth is relatively flattened out, um, there's still a lot of video game players out there. So if you want to make games, make games. Get out there and, and throw your hat in the ring. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? That's it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, when developing a game, do you tend to um, go from concept and theme into mechanics, or vice versa? Do you come up with like a mechanic that you really want to incorporate into a game, and then build a theme around it, or do you have like a theme and story in mind, and then develop the game? It it really depends. Um, uh, so. Um, sometimes, uh, usually for me, I'm a mechanics first designer. Um, I'll have an idea for a mechanic that I think I've never seen before, or the way to doing it that I've never seen before, and then I'll try to design a good game um, with some vague ideas of what the theme might be. Um, other times I'll have a theme in mind, um, uh, but uh, I, usually I'll start from, can I come up with something that's never been done before? And my brain works best in coming up with mechanics that haven't been done before. Uh, rather than themes. And I'm a little bit of the opposite. I generally start with theme, because uh, I like these really silly ideas, like what if I did it this way? And then from that theme, I try to work in mechanisms that make sense for that theme, at least to me. Uh, so I had the right words. Yes. <laughs> My last question, uh, if, right there, purple shirt.
would be very kind of, you know, convince or like tell parents like these tabletop games is good for uh, creating a safe environment for kids. I think the easiest way is to play with them. Get them to sit down, show them what the game's about, and uh, show them uh, how maybe it helps with cognitive skills, how maybe it, it actually does exactly the opposite of turning them into a zombie, which also often they do. So uh, show them that that is not the case about games, and you made a gamer. Don't, don't play zombie games. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually good research out there on the value of gaming. Um, particularly, uh, you look at achievement in chess players later in life. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. But just get on Google Scholar and Google Games. And, yeah, I and try to like, you know, just pin fish and everything. Like, That's well, not going to work. It doesn't work. No, no, you can't give facts to somebody yeah. who's set in their ways. Yeah. It's, it's, that'll, it's actually proven if you try to prove against their thoughts by providing them with facts, they will just double down on, even if they know they're wrong, they'll still double down on their beliefs. You have to show them, and, and, and the best way you can do this is by playing that game with them. Say, hey, give me five minutes. Uh, or, or 50 minutes of your time, if you still think this is just as terrible as you think it is after you're done, okay. So the, the fear for parents is, is uh, a lot of times I think it's the, the theme, right? You got this vision of nerdy D&D uh, &D players, right? Who have no social skills, um, uh, which, which, isn't, which isn't really a true stereotype, but um, it is a stereotype. Um, one of the avenues that a parents, I think, would potentially respond to is if you tell the parents, not necessarily the kids, but you tell the parents, it's educational. Um, uh, the kids will be like, I don't want to play an educational game, but the parents, right, actually, we're learning about Egyptian history, right? We're learning about, you know, and you could, with the, with the amount of games that are out there and the quality of the games, you could come up with an entire curriculum of his, historical curriculum just based on playing good board games that are fun. Um, and, and it, and it, that might be a way to present it to the parents, right? We're, this is actually educational. Your kids are going to learn about Egyptian history, right? Um, and then you and then you bring out, you know, five of the great Egyptian war games that are out there, right? And then you move on to medieval, um, and that might be a way. Uh, Telestrations would be a good game for that, by the way. Uh, Telestrations. Yeah, art yeah. skills. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not chaos in the old world. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, if you have any more questions, then maybe we'll be hanging out outside the door. Uh,